morning session, and our next speaker is Sergio Rey, who is going to talk about PySAL, a Python library for exploratory spatial data analysis and geocomputation. Right, and, and we do have one request uh, from our AV team, which is that anyone who has a question, they request that please walk up to that microphone and ask, your, ask the questions from the microphone over there for the recording. So we're going to honor that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Fernando. Uh, what I want to do is give you, in 20 minutes, or 15 minutes, I guess, an uh, overview of some work we've been doing on this library for spatial analysis in, in Python. I presented uh, a precursor to this in 2009 when PySAL was just kicking off the ground. And it's very exciting to see how wide the community's grown, and it's wonderful to be back, and I think we'll come back more often than every three years or so. So give you the motivation, but then spend most of the time focused on not all the library, but a couple of key components of the library and illustrate some of the functionality to give you some insights as to what types of problems the library is designed uh, for. So as we don't have any motivation, it's blank. Um, how many of you are familiar with Tobler's Law? What is Tobler's Law, for those of you who know? Tobler's Law is that everything is related to everything else, but the nearer things are the more similar they are, or the stronger the relationships, right? To play on the first law of ecology. Uh, and it's really embodiment of this concept of spatial autocorrelation, which is non-random value, attribute value variation in geographic space, which combines notions of value similarity or value dissimilarity and spatial nearness, okay? This is a fundamental piece of why we're doing PySAL, but it's also a fundamental part of our existence as humans. Uh, Michael Goodchild, who's the father of GI science, has this famous quote that hell is a place where you wouldn't have any spatial autocorrelation. Um, think if elevation was ran randomly distributed in space, we, we wouldn't be here, right? Or if temperature, for that matter, wasn't there. Um, so that causes a problem, but it also offers some opportunities. We saw some of the sessions yesterday, particularly in um, the stats models, that in time series context, that dependence is crucial for our ability to make inferences and predictions about the future. Well, similar thing holds in space, except it tends to be a lot more complex. In time context, the recursive the arrows, uh, causal hours recursive, right? The first order lag to February is January. January's first order lag is December. But in space, you can have multi-directional dependencies, right? And non-recursive as well. It can be simultaneous. I live in Arizona part of the year. I live in San Diego the rest of the year. And every time I drive back and forth, I see cars going in the opposite direction. So these types of spatial interactions give rise to spatial dependence. So here's some sort of classical ways to think about spatial dependence to get our, head, get our heads around it. Which of those three patterns is random? If we're using color for hue to signify uh, large values. Multiple choice. Okay, the middle one's random, okay? But then we have two examples of spatial autocorrelation. One where we have positive autocorrelation, value similarity in space, and one where we have non-random value dissimilarity in space. Think about a checkerboard. Those are the classic cases. And there's a pretty rich literature developing test statistics for regular lattices. But our world that I work in and my colleagues is in the social sciences where typically this is the type of data you're dealing with, an irregular lattice. Where we're interested in the same questions, is there spatial structure to that pattern? But we're confronted with irregular units, irregular size, irregular shape. So we want to be able to pull out measures of spatial autocorrelation on these maps, but we need to think carefully about how we reflect the, the neighborhood relations. To give you some sense for the kinds of uh, substantive fields that spatial analysis is relevant for in the social sciences, these are just some of the funding we've had recently goes from anything from criminal justice, spatial criminology, to look at um, hot spots of elevated criminal activity, to public health and epidemiology, looking at spatial patterns of different types of cancer, um, to looking at the impacts of sex offender mobility vis-a-vis -vis restriction zones that are put in place, and down to geospatial uh, microdata, where we have information on individual transactions and housing markets, where you're very interested in the role of spatial context and you want to bring that into your, your modeling frameworks. We have a large team. We've been very fortunate. Myself and my colleague, Luke Anselin, are the leaders of the project, but we've had uh, a number of excellent postdocs come through the center, as well as uh, current PhD students, master students, and even some wonderful undergraduate students 
as well as contributions from the wider community. Where this came from, back to 2009, when we started the project, we were going to leverage earlier projects we had, but we wanted to fill a void in what we saw at that time in the Python community, in that uh, Python had made inroads in the GI science community, social science aspect of GI science, but primarily at the lower ends of the research stack, namely data integration, management, geoprocessing, deriving layers. But once you get to that point, the statistical analysis, either spatial econometrics or exploratory spatial data analysis, there wasn't much there. So we tried to fill that, that void. It's a library, PySAL, so it can be used in many different um, settings. You could develop desktop applications, you could use it at the command line, or plug it into some toolkits that we'll see later, or in a distributed sense. We released our first version in 2010. Uh, July, we're on the six-month release cycle, um, so that we can make use of that copious free time academics evidently have, according to John Hunter. I'd love to be in that world. Um, <laughs> and our release 1.4 will be out in a um, couple weeks. So the overview, uh, you might not be able to read this. There's sub-packages in, in PySAL that speak to different levels or different types of spatial analysis. Uh, and geocomputation. At the core, however, are this notion of spatial weights. They are the half part of this notion of spatial correlation. How do you express neighbor relations in space? I'm going to spend a bit of time on that today. We have a C computational geometry library because we need some concepts from CG to build uh, different definitions of weights. We have algorithms for building regions where it's a multivariate clustering problem, except you have some spatial contiguity considerations you have to build in. The ESDA Exploratory Spatial Data Analysis Module is a test for global and local autocorrelation, as well as a series of map classifiers. The Spatial Dynamics is a library for methods when you have a sequence of maps and you want to explore the evolution of patterns or test for uh, clustering of, spatial, of temporal dynamics. And then the Spatial Econometrics is doing regression with spatially referenced data. Spatial weights, there's a lot of ways to do this, to express the neighbor relationships between every pair of observations in your sample. You could use contiguity-based notions, um, but there's also a rich set of distance-based constructs to think about, k-nearest neighbors, if, you're point, if you have point data or representative points for polygons, um, CG-based weights, kernel weights are used in some of the estimators I'll get to later, hopefully. Regime weights, you could think about imposing uh, regimes on all the counties in a state being a member of the same neighborhood set, something like that, and then combinations of these. The weights support, uh, we support various operations on the weights, different types of transformation standardizations, taking higher orders, we have some set theoretic operations on the weights that have useful um, applications. In the social sciences, there's been a, an explosion of research in doing spatial analysis. And one consequence of that is in different packages, people have developed their own formats for the same things, namely these spatial weights. And we want to facilitate interoperability between these packages. So we support, for example, ArcGIS has about two different ways to express weights in DBFs or SWMs. Uh, Stata has their own module for dealing weights. Uh, wind bugs, geobugs geo as well. And we can read and write most of these. This is the most common type of uh, spatial data a social scientist deals with, a shapefile. How many of you have worked with shapefiles? All right, what's the problem with shapefile from a, that question of building up neighbor relationships is it's non-topological. They're known as spaghetti files. There's no topology in these files. You have to extract it. And we spend a lot of time with developing fast algorithms to build the weights from the shape files. So here's a little example. We're going to take that, those southern counties and develop two different contiguity-based weights, one based on the rook definition of contiguity, like a rook would move in a chessboard, and one based on the queen. So it's basically a one-liner to build this weights object, uh, which you can think of as a n by n matrix, but turns out these are very, tend to be very sparse, depending on your notion of neighbor relationship. Um, and then there's properties of the weights that are set, and there's some methods under the hood. So very simple way to do this. So looking at some of the other modules, just selecting them, the spatial dynamics module is the one I worked on a lot because it's where my substantive interests are. And you can think about this in two ways. You can think about having, uh, say, a, a bunch of regional time series, and you're interested in identifying clusters of places that display similar dynamics. Okay, this is relevant in the debates about defining optimal currency areas as they 
uh, euro starts to fall apart, maybe it's not an optimal currency area anymore, but also in literatures on regional inequality and um, spatial poverty traps. The other way to do it is coming out of geography where you have a time series of maps and you're interested in characterizing the role of space in the evolution of those patterns. This is becoming increasingly important in coupled human natural systems where agent-based modeling, cellular autonomous models are used, and you need ways to express how space is uh, working in those contexts. Uh, a piece of the dynamics library is, to, uh, use, is used in the uh, convergence literature where you have a series of, uh, say, regional incomes for a number of years, say, 70 or so years, and you want to classify how the income distribution is changing over time. The workhorse in the literature is a simple discrete Markov chain where you put the incomes in quintiles in each year and you look at the probability of transitioning out of the bottom or moving up to the top. But there's no geography there, there's no space, right? So we've built in space by basically conditioning the chain on the spatial context for each observation. So for example, this probability here, 0.963, that's a probability that a, an economy in the bottom quintile stays in that quintile at the end of the year, but it's a poor economy surrounded by poor economies. We have five classes in the quintile. If we contrast that to an equally poor economy, but an economy whose neighbors are a little bit better off than the poorest, the probability moving up increases. So it speaks to the role of spatial context there. Another way this literature looks at spatial dynamics is with like Kendall's tau, rank correlation measure. You look at how concordant the ranks are between two, times, two points in time. Again, there's no space there. It doesn't matter where those economies are in space or whatever attribute you're looking at. We have a method where you decompose the concordance measure into that that's due to neighbors and that that's non-neighbor pairs and test whether the concordance relationship's different. And it is, this is an example looking at Mexico uh, regional income dynamics. As an aside, in doing that, I had to come up with a fast algorithm for Kendall's tau because it's an uh, n squared runtime. Um, so I started using Kendall's, uh, Kendall's tau from SciPy and then implemented a tree-based method that turned out to be actually faster. I had no idea it was going to be because the one in, in uh, SciPy was pretty fast. Um, so maybe we'll put in a pull request for this. I'm going to skip over this because um, it's another aspect of the spatial dynamics literature or modules in PySAL. And we currently have a, a deliverable for the project of putting a GUI on top of some of the spatial dynamics pieces of the library. It's called CAST. Uh, last time I was here, I talked about STARS, which was a similar type of package where fully interactive graphics do brushing, linking, view-generated views. And this is very nice because it supports point data. On the lower left, we have a kernel densities for hotspots. In this case, it's crime and Tempe. And then um, other types of aerial unit data. The rest of my time, in terms of the library, I want to focus on the spatial econometrics module because this is probably the most, um, the thing we get the most a request from other social scientists for. And the reason is there's a lot of interest in applying spatially explicit econometric methods to social science data um, and even non-social science data. Remote sensing people are starting to contact us. However, in commercial software, this is still pretty rare. Right now, only Stata has some functionality to support different, a limited set of the spatial econometrics um, tool set. Uh, what you also have are people writing one-off scripts for different languages like SAS or um, SPSS and so on. The coverage is much better in the open source world, and again, that speaks to the power of open source. Uh, in the R project, SPDEP is a really good library for um, spatial analysis on polygon data, like the kind we saw here. And then in MATLAB, uh, the work by Jim LeSage, Kelly Pace, and Paul Erhurst developing similar functionality in MATLAB. But we didn't have anything like this in Python, so that's where our component, SPREG, comes in for this. Our goal is to have this scale up to large problems. So if you think about looking at all the uh, apartment and parcel transitions in New York City, that's the scale we want to get to, because that's the kind of demands we're, we're, that are being placed on us. So that calls for really efficient weights, and there we've made heavy use of SciPy's sparse. It's been excellent to get us um, some huge performance boost that we'll see in a second. This is the kind of problem you're facing. This is one specification in spatial econometrics. So you have some variable y, n observations on that, so that's an n by 1 vector. You have x, your traditional right-hand side variables, um, with a beta parameter on there. 
an error term that might be well behaved, it might not be well behaved, but then that, sec that first term on the right hand side, that's the spatial lag. So it's simply a product, the weights matrix times the y vector and a scale or autoregressive parameter rho. Okay, so that's an n by n matrix if you do it in full. Um, what kinds of problems that imposes on us is if you wanted to do, say, maximum likelihood estimation of this, this is your likelihood function, and the fly in the ointment is here, you have to take the determinant of this i minus rho w matrix. It's an n by n matrix, so this could be a mil two million by two million matrix, right? There's some shortcuts, some uh, approximations based on eigenvalues of the w matrix that have been suggested in the literature. However, as n grows, those become highly unstable and basically not too reliable. So this is a major computational challenge. There's also a challenge if you want to turn around, if you've estimated the model and use it for prediction, because of the re reduced form, you have this n by n inverse. Okay, that's a full matrix, even though W might be sparse. So what do we have in SPREG? We have a suite of methods uh, for estimation. We have instrumental variables for spatial two-stage two least squares. We have general method of moments for models where you have the error dependence, you have the spatial dependence in the error term, and then different flavors of that, whether the error terms are also heteroscedastic or not, or homoscedastic. Um, robust method of estimation of the covariance matrix for your parameters, the hack estimators, and then a family of diagnostics for different types of spatial effects, namely based on Lagrange multiplier types of tests. And then in 1.4, which will be out, we actually have a probe it with spatial diagnostics for testing for spatial effects in this type of limited dependent variable model. There is a GUI that comes along with SPREG because many of the people who want to use PySAL do not want to touch a shell, so they want an interface, and it's, we have an embarrassment of riches of really powerful interfaces now to choose from. Um, this just simply rests on top of the library. So get me a weights matrix, here's my shape file, read the DBF, get me my attributes, and then select my estimator. In this case, it's just simply OLS with the diagnostics at the bottom, different tests for different types of spatial dependence, whether the dependence is in the Y or in the error term, and how to distinguish between those. Okay, so estimation of the lag, uh, or you could do it the way most of us would do it in the room, at, from the command line. It's important, as I said, we want to make the scale. So we've done some experiments comparing the capabilities in SPREG with that in the R project, SPDEP. So here we're looking at implementing uh, the diagnostic test for spatial dependence on artificial lattices, right? And we're able to attach, attack the same size problem. We're up to 2.2 million observations, but our scale is very well time-wise. The R project, um, not, so, not so well. Estimation is a ch more uh, challenging problem, uh, and we see another difference here in that we start to get uh, not as um, strong scaling, but we're able to deal with a much larger sample size than in the R because of the way the memory is dealt with in R and the way we're able to exploit basically uh, SciPy sparse. Okay, so where we're going in the future, uh, PySAL, one way it's used, another way it's used is the plug into toolkits. So ArcGIS has Python, they've chosen Python as a scripting language, so you can pull up, build your own toolkits, and we have one in work there for uh, PySAL. There's like 650 toolboxes now in ArcGIS, so we're one of the many. And then more near, near, near dear to my heart, I had a geocomputation seminar. I had some advanced undergrad students take PySAL and plug it into QGIS, which is an open source. QJS with, I would argue, an even better Python plugin architecture. So they did this in a span of like seven weeks. It was great. Uh, in GI Science 2012, which is in uh, Columbus in about uh, a month or two, uh, we're going to do a full day workshop on PySAL, the whole, the whole kit and caboodle. So if you're there, uh, please join us. Maybe next year we'll submit a tutorial. The tutorial has been great here, so I'd like to do one if we can. Uh, and if you're interested, visit the PySAL site, the Geoda Center, or I'll be around, just uh, send me an email. And I'll leave it there. <laughs>